All right, so continuing with our previous video lecture on HLA Hart's uh, The Concept of Law, this video focuses on the second chapter of Hart's book, which is entitled Laws, Commands, and Orders. Now, the aim behind this chapter is uh, for Hart to introduce elements of law to us and also to reintroduce or reacquaint us with various elements present within Austin's command uh, or imperative uh, theory of law and to compare real life examples of the way that the law functions with Austin's command theory that he presents to us uh, and to show how there are a lot of differences between the two and how Austin's command theory of law does not, uh, indeed cannot live up to the idea of law as we perceive it in our day to day lives. So the first part of the second chapter uh, in Hart's book is named uh, Varieties of Imperatives. Within this section of the chapter, Hart brings attention to the popularity that Austin's imperative or command theory of law had gained uh, at that time, you know, within the legal field following his lectures, Province of Jurisprudence Determined, which he looked at previously in one of uh, our previous videos. Now, given the popularity of Austin's theory, which it had gained uh, by the time that Hart was writing, Hart attempts now in the second chapter to introduce elements, like I said, which are characteristic of law into Austin's theory to suggest how Austin's theory fails to account for such essential characteristics of law. To do that, Hart introduces us to the gunman model. This gunman model is intended to be an embodiment of Austin's command theory since Austin's theory centers around a sovereign who commands people to do things they do not wish to do, backed by the threat of sanctions. But this is similar enough in Hart's view to a gunman, who orders people to do things by threatening to shoot them, for example, if they do not obey him. Therefore, in the second chapter of his book, Hart shall introduce elements of law within the gunman model to show us how the gunman model will not be able to withstand the essential characteristics of laws, and so how, with the crumbling down of the gunman model, even Austin's theory of law shall also crumble down. So first of all, uh, Hart points out the difference between ordering or, you know, coercion and giving an order. So basically the distinction that Hart is trying to make here is uh, the distinction between ordering and giving an order. Pointing out how the gunman just coerces or forces or orders his victim, but it cannot be said that the gunman gave an order to his victim. Since giving an order implies some pre-existing authority over the other person, which is missing in the gunman's case. The gunman has only a temporary ascendancy or superiority over his victim, not by virtue of some pre-existing authority that the victim was already under a duty to obey. And please note the word duty here because it has a lot of significance, which we shall explore later. Uh, the gunman's temporary ascendancy stems from the fact that he is in possession of the gun by way of which he can coerce or force the bank clerk in, in handing over the money to him. There is no such authority that the gunman otherwise has that we could say that the clerk is uh, under a duty to obey him. Thus, Austin's theory that threats of sanctions or, 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 you know, or evil puts the other person under a duty to obey the threats neglects the idea of authority behind a duty. Being under a duty or being under an obligation suggests respect for authority, not fear of evil. This way, Austin blurs the distinction between being obliged and being under an obligation. And there are a lot of differences between these two ideas of being obliged and being under an obligation. Because being obliged is born out of fear of evil, whereas being under an obligation stems from respect for authority. So again, two very, you know, uh, authoritative uh, sounding words that we, we've encountered here and which I've just uttered are respect and authority. And these ideas are completely neglected in Austin's command theory of law. Now, within the second section of uh, this chapter, which is entitled Law as Coercive Orders, Hart takes objection to Austin's saying that the sovereign addresses his commands to his subjects, since the word addresses implies you know, individuated face-to-face -face orders being given to those required to comply with them. Hart says that laws are mostly general, rather than being individually notified to those to whom they apply. 
Thus, even if a person is not aware of the laws of his country, those laws are still applicable to him. As we know, ignorance of law is no defense. The situations in which laws are individually notified to people are mostly when they breach a rule of law. For example, when a person fails to pay taxes, the tax inspector might personally bring his attention to the requirement of paying taxes. Thus, the individuated face-to-face -face notification of the law by officials usually becomes relevant at the enforcement stage. When a law is breached, but the law is applicable to every person, even if their attention has not been brought to it individually. Secondly, Hart also highlights the fact that whereas the gunman's orders expire the moment the clerk complies with them, the law remains binding on the citizens, even if they have been obeyed, since the gunman's ascendancy over the clerk is temporary. Like I said, you know, the gunman's ascendancy over the clerk remains only for so long as he is under the gunman's control and coercion. Whereas the law has a standing character. The law binds a person forever until such time as it has been repealed by the relevant manner in form. Hart also takes objection to Austin's idea of general habit of obedience to the sovereign, which shall constitute the sovereign in the first place. As Austin says, and as you might remember if you've seen my previous videos, Austin says that for there to be a sovereign and a lawmaker, the sovereign has to be obeyed by his subjects habitually. Hart poses the question that for how long must the sovereign be obeyed and by how many people before we could say that the territory consists of a legal system? As this question is capable of no definitive answer, it makes the determination of the existence of a legal system inconclusive, which is unhelpful. So this was a summary of the second chapter of Hart's book. Uh, in my next jurisprudence uh, lecture series video, I'm going to be discussing the third chapter of Hart's book, which is uh, much more, you know, uh, detailed than the first two chapters of Hart's book, and which is quite complex, a uh, very um, important from uh, the examination perspective, because that is where Hart introduces uh, the idea to us that law has a lot of uh, variations within itself. Uh, there are varieties of laws, not just the sanction-based laws that Austin talks about, but also power conferring rules, uh, which do not coerce uh, people to behave in a certain manner, but also to be able to realize their wishes if they wish to give rise to transactions within a legal framework. So it is uh, those areas of law uh, which Austin has been claimed to have neglected within his theory that we will be exploring in our next lecture, uh, followed by, obviously, uh, chapter 4, 5, and 6 of Haas' book. Uh, and I hope that with, by watching each of these videos, your understanding of Haas' concept of law will be strengthened. And oh, if you watch these videos on repeat, they are going to uh, enable you even more to understand the substance of what Hart is trying to argue and propose. 